if you are doing geography, GCSE, at Excel, B, um, then you will come across the term atmospheric circulation and you will need to know a bit about it. Um, so firstly, so that's what, so I'll, I'll be telling you about it in this video, basically everything you need to know. Um, so what is global atmospheric circulation to begin with? It's basically the movement of something around the earth that could be anything, but in terms of the course, we'll be looking at heat. So why is it necessary to move heat around the earth to begin with? Um, that's because of the global latitude heat budget. So what that means is that the earth isn't heated equally. Not all areas of the earth have the same temperature. And some areas like the equator will have a surplus of heat. They'll have more heat. And some areas like the poles will have a deficit of heat. They'll have less heat. Um, and this is despite the fact that the sun gives out the same amount of energy. So why is it that some, are hot, some places are hotter, some places are cooler? In the exam, it always comes back to the curvature of the Earth. The Earth is not flat, of course, it's a sphere. So this creates two problems, which I will show you here. This is the Earth, this is the sun. And as we can see, the pole is a lot further away from the sun than the equator is, creating two problems. So one, the distribution area. The area that the light is distributed across at the pole is a lot greater than the area than the light is distributed across at the equator. As we can see at the pole, the light has to fill all of this, whereas at the equator, it's only shared amongst this amount. So that means at the pole, there is less concentrated um, amount of heat radiation, meaning there is less heat received by each part of the pole and therefore it's cold, cooler. So that's one. Distribution area is greater at the poles therefore meaning the pole is cooler. Secondly the amount of air the amount of atmosphere that the light has to travel through is a lot greater at the poles. Now it's the same principle as um, surface area and distribution area. The amount of atmosphere that the light travels through at the pole is a lot greater than at the equator due to the curvature of the earth. This means that there is more atmosphere in contact with the light radiation than at the equator. More contact means more heat is lost, so less heat is received at the pole than at the equator, and the pole is cooler. So how does the Earth attempt to address this heat budget? Um, just to recap, uh, the heat budget is, is the difference in heat at different places on the Earth due to the Earth's curvature, which means that the amount of atmosphere and the distribution of the light and heat is affected. Um, the Earth can attempt to address this in a few ways. So it can do this by circulation cells, which I'll get onto, ocean currents, which I'll also get onto, and trade winds. Trade winds aren't on our spec, but if you would like to know more about them, I can always do a video about that separately. So circulation cells, our Earth is made up of these cells that I, you can see here. They are the Hadley, Ferrell and Polar cells. Just know that the Polar is at the poles, Hadley is at the equator and the Ferrell is the thing in between that is just dictated by the other, by the other cells. So these cells are needed to basically move air from one bit of the Earth to another bit of the Earth. And they couldn't just be one big atmospheric cell because it, it just wouldn't work. The Earth it is so big and it's so different in terms of temperature and topography and it wouldn't work, it would get broken up too easily. So that's why there are three different cells that are needed and these three cells are the same in each quarter. So there'll be three cells here, the same three here, the same three here and the same three here. Um, these cells are driven by the principles of um, convection currents. So these convection currents, if you've done physics GCSE or haven't done it yet, uh, it doesn't matter, I'll explain it to you now. So the main key points is that heat or hot things rise. They become less dense and they rise. Cold things are more dense, so they sink. And it's the same with air. So if you see the blue areas, this is where the air is rising. And if you see the red areas, this is where the air is sinking. So why does the air sink and why does the air rise at different places? So we know that the equator is the hottest part of the Earth. 
This means that the air above it is heated as well because it's just heated very, very much. So if the air is heated, the particles basically, you don't need to put this in your um, G GCSE geography explanation, but the particles gain more kinetic energy, so they move more, and this is what you have to include, the air becomes less dense when it's heated, so it rises. This means that the air will rise, and as it rises, it gets cooler. Because if you've ever gone abroad, if you've ever gone on top of a mountain, you'll, realize, you'll notice that it's a lot cooler up there because it's just thinner, it's further away, it's from the surface of the earth, it's just cooler. So there's no exception. When a hot thing is in a cool climate, it cools down. When hot air is in a cool climate, it cools down. So as this air is hot air rises, it cools, it condenses, and it forms clouds. These clouds rain, and this forms a very um, consistent area of high rainfall. And if I told you that the rainforest was located along the equator, would that be a surprise to you? So if you think about why it's, at, why it's located where it is, it's found at an area where the heat is rising, where the air is rising. So if the air is rising, the air is also condensing. If the air condenses, clouds are formed. If clouds are formed, rain is formed. So it's a very wet area, so that's why there are rainforests along this band at the equator. Now, we call this hot air rising and this area of kind of unstable, stormy weather. We call that low pressure. So if you think about it from the viewpoint of the, the Earth, if the air is rising, there's less pressure on the Earth, there's less pressure of the air onto the Earth, so there's low pressure because it's going up, it's not exerting any force on the ground, not exerting as much force on the ground, so it's low pressure. If we have low pressure, it's likely that there's a high pressure too. And that high pressure is where you see this red, where the air is forcefully sinking and exerting a force on the ground. So if hot air rises, what happens when that air is cold? So this air at the top is cold now, isn't it? Because it's lost all its heat and it's condensed and now it's lost its moisture as well because it's rained. So what happens to the air when it rises? It doesn't just sink back down, it doesn't really work like that, it's a current, it's continually moving. So instead of falling back down, the cold air will move leftwards or rightwards, it will move polewards and go as far as it can until it becomes too heavy and then it suddenly sinks. So cold air, for the explanation, um, is more dense because the particles are closer together um, and therefore sinks. Now, if the air sinks, this creates a region of a desert region or an arid region is the is the word that the board likes you to use. And arid basically just means dry. So at the areas where it's red, there's not much rainfall. And if I told you that the Sahara Desert was along these places and there was a desert here and a desert there, it might not surprise you because there's no rain in these areas. And that's because the cold air is so dense and it sinks. And the cold air is is heavier than the warm air that's trying to rise. And if you think the warm air that rises is what is going to create rain, and if that can't if that can't penetrate the cold air, then no rain is going to form. No clouds are formed, the hot air won't get high enough to be able to condense, so it will just be dry. And so if we think about what sort of places would be um, formed by high pressure, that would be deserts, that would be grasslands, it would be very dry climates. And obviously, if low pressure is when the air is going away, then high pressure is when the air is sinking back down, exerting a force, like I said before. Um, and people can get a bit confused with low pressure, high pressure, and which is which. I definitely did, I got that wrong so many times in GCSE. <laughs> But if you think about it from the perspective of the Earth, like I said before, just think about it. If the air is going away, there's less force. If the air is bogging down, then it's more force. And just remember that cold air, hot, more dense air, will stop any less dense air from rising. Therefore, no clouds, no rain. It's all good. So that was circulation cells. And what you do need to know is that 
There are three different cells. You need to know the names of them. You need to know the types of climate that arise from where the cells converge and sink. So where it's high pressure, it's going to be arid. And you need to know the types of climate when the air is um, rising and that's low pressure, it's rainy, it's wet and rainforests and tropical, all, all of those things. And that's all you need to know for that. So then I talked about ocean currents as well as it being another way that heat is distributed around the earth. Um, and there's one main system, there's one main current that allows heat to be taken from the equator to the poles and all of that. That's called the thermohaline conveyor. Um, you don't need to specifically name it, but you need to know the process of it, how it distributes heat and what it, what that means. So, as I was saying before, hot things rise, cool things sink, and it's no different with air or with water. So, if we think about the equator again, at the equator, it's very hot, so the water will be warmed too. If the water is warmed, the particles will gain more kinetic energy, they'll move further apart, but they'll be less dense. So the warm water will rise to the surface and it will then, because it's a current, because the ocean is continually moving, it will then be pushed away from the equator towards the poles. As it travels along the surface, some of the water will be evaporated because it's near the equator still, even though it's going polewards, it's still at the equator. So there'll still be water evaporating, evaporating. And if we think about what salt water, what seawater is, it's salt and water. So if more water is leaving, there is more salt left in the water. And if there's more salt, it becomes more dense. Additionally, if the water is moving towards the poles, it will become colder. And what do cold things do? It sinks. So because of the salinity of the water is now higher, because there's more salt in the water, and because the water is becoming colder, the water will sink. It will sink to the bottom and it will move along the ocean depths um, back towards the equator because it's continuing the convection current. So that's it really. That's all for convection currents, for ocean currents, circulation cells, why heat needs to be dis distributed around. Um, what you could also note is the disrupt, they might also ask you about the disruption of these things. For example, what happens if the glaciers melt? So glaciers are fresh water, so they aren't salt water, and they are, they, they could potentially disrupt the thermohaline conveyor by adding different densities to the water and then making the whole system collapse. I can do another video about climate change and what this means for, um, what it means for the earth and another time but that's it if you have any questions just put them in the comments below and yeah hope you like the video